Stop what you are doing. Look around you and try to find a computer. This is a computer. That's a computer. And that one. This bad boy computes. That might be one. And that one. And that one. There's one. And there's another. And there- wait, no. no. That's soup. That, that's soup with a hat. No, 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 no. Okay, okay, let's- let's cool down on the pointing. But you get the idea. Computers are everywhere around you. They control a lot of your daily life. So let's go on an adventure to try to find out how they work. I'd like to start by taking a look at a computer. Well, so what we just watched was a machine that had input programmed into the drum stored in either a flat or raised up position. The program ran one single line at a time, and each raised pin struck only the specifically tuned note in front of it, all moving at a constant speed regulated by air resistance. Thus resulted in the output song we heard. This song will always sound exactly the same unless we change the drum to a different program with a different song. This is all mechanical, but how can we simulate this without any physical moving parts and with electricity? It all starts with arguably the single greatest invention known to man, the transistor. This must be a pretty mind-blowing, inconceivable technical masterpiece, but what does it do? It's got three legs. Current will only flow through if a small current is sent to the middle leg. So it's like a switch. It's a switch. Not that switch. Although, that's got billions of these little guys. The magic comes in when we arrange these transistors into these three logic gates, AND, OR, and NOT. The AND gate uses two transistors in series, so current can only flow through if both transistors are turned on. The OR gate allows current to flow through if either transistor is on. In the NOT gate, Current is flowing through, but will stop if the transistor is turned on. The NOT gate is my personal favorite because if you take two NOT gates and put the output of one as the input of the other, it will stay locked in that position. This is how RAM chips hold memory. If you're like me, you'll want to see this in the real world, not just in animation. I created this circuit board to show what we have learned so far. You can see all the transistors used to make these gates. The far left one is the AND gate. Both buttons have to be pressed for the red light to light up. In the next one, either button will turn on the blue light, so this is the OR gate. And the NOT gate is on unless the button is pressed. Then I arrange the NOT gates to create four bits of RAM. So the top row button writes to memory, and the bottom row will clear it. This memory is temporary and will go away when the circuit loses power. That's why you may have seen a small battery in an old video game. It was to maintain power to hold the saved data. Here's an example to show how logic gates can be used. Imagine I have a TV, radio, laptop, and lamp in my room. I could wire a direct line from a switch to each of these devices, but I have certain rules that I want to apply. When I listen to my radio or use my laptop, I like to turn off the TV if it's on because it's distracting to me. So I can use an OR gate to turn off a NOT gate connected to the TV, giving me the result I want. I also want my lamp to be on if both my radio and laptop are on because it's dark in that corner of my room. So I can check for that with an AND gate. If someone calls me, I want to use the switch to turn off all these devices if they are on because I find it hard to concentrate when I'm talking on the phone. So with enough logic gates, you can do anything you want. You can shrink this down to an IC chip and use it in a circuit. I think it's finally time to unveil a true passion project of mine that I've been working on for a very long time. This is my very own simple homemade computer. I want to let you know that electronics are not my background, I did not learn about this in school, computers are always just magic boxes controlled by tiny wizards, I did not understand computer terms, specifications, and that really started to bother me. When I started to do my own research, I was blown away by how small parts and simple concepts can build to make the powerhouse machines that are small enough to fit and carry in our own pockets. 
Just like the music box, we need a timer to keep the pace of each instruction. This red circuit board makes the red LED blink. On my computer, the speed is adjustable anywhere from once up to 200 times a second, and the number of times a second is measured in hertz. This green circuit board is my program counter. It counts from 0 to 15, but how? Our normal counting system has 10 symbols. Computers only have two, which is called binary. When we count, the placement of the digit matters. We increment until we need to reset and increase the next placeholder. It's the same with two symbols. The placement holds a value, and this is what it looks like counting. And if we wanted to show the number 13 in binary, it would need one number 8 plus 4 plus 1. The number 42 would be 32 plus 8 plus 2. Note that I've reversed the direction for easier understanding. With some practice, reading numbers in binary will become as normal as reading regular numbers. Here is my counter, which is using logic gates to count from 0 to 15. This last chip is my memory, the RAM. Remember the 4 bits from earlier? Imagine that inside a chip but 8 bits sitting on a row, 16 rows tall. We call 8 bits 1 byte, so 16 bytes of RAM. The green program counter number is the address or row number of the RAM that the blue lights are showing. We can't have more RAM because our counter's 4 bits can only count to 15. My 200Hz clock speed, 16 bytes of RAM, 4-bit bus is nothing compared to these machines, but mine is built so it's easy to visually see what is going on. I hope one day to make a new one closer to an Atari specs so I can make my own game console. Well, what's a computer without programs? Let's take a look at one now. This is great for a computer to read, but not us humans. Let's break it down. My computer can only read 8 bits at a time. I made the first 4 bits for data, also called operands. The next 4 bits control what happens, called opcodes. The data is sent directly to the first 4 blue LEDs up top. And then we get to the last instruction, which is different. These bits directly affect the logic gates inside the program counter. If the bit goes low, then I can halt the program, reset the counter, or load the counter to another address. So I will show you each of these instructions now. This is what the halting looks like. The program simply stops increasing. Reset will reset the counter back to zero, creating an infinite loop. and loading will jump to another address in RAM, in this case 14. Since I'm able to show numbers with the first 4 bits and create loops using the opcodes, I can connect this computer to external outputs. For instance, I made this speaker with 4 different notes that is very similar to the way the music box plays notes. Although, this doesn't sound very good, so that's enough of that. Moving on, the same idea can be applied to control motors and robotics. I even made this draw on an Etch-a-Sketch. I want to demonstrate this program running before I show the code to see if you can figure out how it works. What you can see first is individual lines drawn top to bottom, when the clock speed is increased to show each frame above 24 times a second, the image will appear constant to our eyes. Then I use a controller to change what image is drawn, and I can switch back and forth between the number 1 or number 2. So let's take a look at the code. We know how to send the first 4 bits of data to draw one line, but I put a chip on the display that uses logic gates to switch to the next line. So we can draw any image line by line. In this case, I want the number 1. But then we need to check for user input, and if nothing is pressed, then reset to the beginning. But how does the button work? In my controller, I have these tiny switches that I can send any 8 bits to override the current 8-bit instruction. So what if I set it to jump to address 7, then it will skip over the reset instruction to draw the next image and get caught in a similar loop, resetting instead back to address 7. And if we add another button to reset to line 0, then we can switch between the first loop and the second loop, creating two different images. Finally, let's try to make an alarm clock. Let's draw a countdown from 4 to 0, then turn on the lowest tone. Check for user input, then reset back to 5 so it stays in that beeping loop. 
Our clock needs a snooze alarm, so let's make one button jump into the snooze loop where it counts down from 2 this time, before beeping with a higher pitched tone. Then our other button can jump out of that loop and halt the program, turning off the alarm. Let's see it in action. I'm pretty happy with how this project turned out, especially considering I had to teach myself all about electronics, and I ended up failing a lot and came close to giving up multiple times, but something really made me want to keep going. Yes, this is very fundamental and the specs are laughable, but when scaled up with more RAM, a larger program counter, a faster clock speed, more IC chips that use logic gates to do things like add numbers, compare values, this would start to resemble a functional computer. It would be fun to make my own video game console with interchangeable 3D printed game cartridges, all programmed with simple zeros and ones, so let me know what you think about that. I quickly brushed over these topics, but I hope you learned something, or at least found this interesting and entertaining. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you next time.